This is sort of an interesting uh, subject, uh, particularly with the uh, recent onset of the metal on metal revolution in total hip replacement and the surface replacements. I want to thank my co-author, Dr. David Lee, who did all the work here, carried the load. Uh, he's a uh, head uh, researcher for the data center for the cancer group at the University of Miami and a professor of epidemiology at the University of Miami. There's been a recent increase in popular requests by patients to their total hip doctors asking them, can I have a surface replacement so that I can do triathlons? And uh, all of us have this kind of concept of the active young guy that needs a total hip, he's too young for it, total hips only last 10 years. And uh, if you really think about this angle that I'm going to show you today, you may not want to do metal on metal on these young patients anymore. The incidence of cancer is very low. The United States has over 300 million people, and we only have a million four new cases of cancer every year. In Florida, with about 20 some million people, we only have 100,000 new cases. So the new cases of cancer, even though we see all this marketing campaign by the Cancer Society, are not that many. Uh, the new cases of lung cancer, 215,000, prostate, the second most common on breast. If you look at bone and joint cancer, it's even lower. We have about 2,500 new cases of bone and joint cancers in the country. This is out of the cancer registry from last year. And oncogenesis around an implant comes in two flavors, at site, right where you put the implant in, and remote. Now, I can tell you for a fact that at-site cancers from metal and metal are probably never going to be shown to exist. We just have too few bone and joint cancers in the world to ever demonstrate that there's a causality effect. Remote cancers, on the other hand, uh, such as leukemia, lymphoma, could occur. And it's something that we need to think about when we are recommending uh, to a young patient a metal and metal implant. This is the first well-documented case in the British Journal, 1984, malignant soft tissue tumor at the site of a total hip replacement. A number of papers have been written, the most sophisticated one by the uh, Finnish researcher on cancer risk after metal on metal and poly uh, on metal total hips. This is in core, it's a very interesting paper because it shows that the total hip patients and total knee patients have less cancer than the general population. So if you have a total hip, you decrease your chances of getting cancer. Now you need to understand what the concept of relative risk is, and this is a table of relative risk for all cancers in that finished study. And the chances of leukemia and Hodgkin's in that study was double what it is on the regular population, double. The objective of my paper today is to show you the state of knowledge in 2008 about oncogenesis in arsoplasty and to give you an estimate of the sample sizes needed to truly and scientifically look at cancer risk. We did a careful review of the world literature using Medline, PubMed, and then we used a massive research tool, Google, okay? So we Googled a few terms. Remember that in the past, we used to get up here and say, hey, this is a great operation. I've done a thousand of them and nothing happens to them. Well, this is 2008. We practice based on evidence-based medicine. You have to read the literature and you have to answer the questions using scientific methodology. It's no longer acceptable for a surgeon to get up here and tell you, I've done 1,500 of those and I've never had a problem. So we're all reading a hell of a lot more than we ever did. And we went from doing case report decision to doing prospective randomized trials, which we don't do enough. If you go on the level of evidence sophistication, the first level is case report, then it's a registry, then it's a case control design, and lastly, a prospective randomized trial. We went to the cancer stats that are kept fairly uh, tight by the National Cancer Group, and, and we use some power analysis to give you some estimates as to what you need to do to answer the question of whether you can actually produce a doubling rate of some unusual cancers in the young population over time. If you look at Google, you'll see that in total hip replacement, you have three million sites to go look at it. When you look at hip, metal on metal, 11 million. There's a tremendous interest in this whole concept of big heads and metal on metal. And if you look at the U.S. usage of metal total hip replacement, we're up to 27% of every total hip done in the United States uses a metal on metal surface. Pretty scary. Cancer and total hip replacement, only two million hits. Oncogenesis and carcinogenesis are not that interesting to people. 
There were only 46 reported cases in the world literature about on-site malignancy. So I'm not concerned about that. Only 11 studies in which relative risk and standard incidence ratio, which are the standard to assess the level of risk of anything, uh, were published in the world literature. Arthroplasty prevalence in the United States is 0.21 per 100,000. 0.21. Sarcoma incidence is 3 per 100,000. Leukemia is 12 per 100,000. So if you think about this, we're trying to find causality for things that are very unusual in very small populations, which scientifically is extremely difficult. Our model demonstrated that to do a case study, because a prospective randomized trial is unpractical in the United States. I doubt that very many centers are going to tell their patients you're going to be randomized to a metal or a plastic hip, whether you want it or not. And the Mayo Clinic and the Cleveland Clinic and a number of large institutions have had to abandon randomized clinical trials because patients don't want to enroll. They want to do whatever the hell they want. This is America, home of the free, land of the brave. I want no nothing to do with that randomized trial. So the only way to do sophisticated research studies in our society, in our environment, are with case control studies. And in order to look at case control studies and ca in cancer and total hip, you need to look at 4,400 cases of cancer and 22,000 control cases to be able to detect a 0.5% or a 50% increase in cancer cases in any cancer. So if you look and you assume that only 0.1% of the population receives a metal on metal hip and you do the power calculations, you're looking at 44,000 cases that need to be studied and 220,000 controls. If you're going to do a randomized clinical trial, if we could do it, we would need 50,000 hips randomized and we need to look at them for greater than five years. So in summary, there's a body of literature that says that uh, with respect to all cancers and total hip replacement, there's actually a decrease in the relative risk of cancer. That's a selection process. The people that get total hips, they have access to care. They're different people. They want to do things when they're 85, they want to play tennis. So we have a different population, and these studies, I think, are very good, and I think I'm not concerned about cancer using a metal and plastic based on the literature. If you look at the latest two studies, this is a cohort from uh, the ACTA Orthopedica Scandinavica, 73,000 patient, patients. Again, this is a registry study. It's got its problem scientifically. It's not a case control study. It's not a randomized clinical trial. Yet they showed that there's no elevation in cancer rate. Same thing, British Journal of Cancer, 2005. They have registries over there. No elevation in risk of cancer 10 years after arthroplasty. I would like to remind you about the type 2 error in which we say there's nothing there and there's something there, okay? And that's something that a scientist, if you really analyze this data, you would agree with me that we don't have enough information to categorically say that total hip and total knee replacements do, may not cause any small increase in some of the hematologic cancers. The cost of these metal and metals is almost two to three thousand dollars more per case. So our specialty, total joint replacement guys, and I include myself in it, are actually increasing their cost of care to the country uh, with a questionable issue whether they get a better outcome uh, by 250 million dollars a year. Deciding on bearing surfaces with very little hard-based information. So we may not be helping people sometimes when we give them advice as to what the right bearing surface is. Uh, at the end of the day, my message to you, the United States doesn't have a national registry. I know uh, Jim Beatty's here and he's been a, a key element in getting this thing moved forward. We've made tremendous advances in changing some of the laws to create a national registry in the United States. The British registry has 198,000 hips in it since it started. The Swedish registry has 270,000 hips. Well, we could put double those hips in two years in the United States. We're doing close to 350,000 hips a year here if we had that national registry. There's a lot of people that don't want it, starting with industry, starting with doctors. Patients want it. The lawyers want it. And I think at the end of the day, we should want it. It's not going to be easy, but I think we're going to have some really good answers for you over the next uh, five to ten years. Thank you for your attention.